So I'm sitting here just about 50 feet up the hill from the lot because it's shady and it's a warm May day and I made the mistake of wearing a long sleeve shirt today. So it's pretty nice in the shade, but we are to the point now where we have to decide what sort of a foundation we're gonna put under this house. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that the foundation is probably the most important part of your house. It's certainly the most difficult part of a house to fix if it goes bad. I've done that a few times. I've gone as far as to have to pick a house up and move it off a foundation, tear the foundation out, put one back and move the house back. And that, the costs add up pretty quick when you have to do something like that. So as we think about what kind of a foundation to install and you think about what kind of foundation you might want to install, you need to think about what does a foundation do? It holds the house at the right elevation and distributes the weight of the house on the soil. It embeds into the soil so the house has lateral stability, so it doesn't just slip down the hill or in the event of an earthquake slide all over the place. It has to be embedded in the soil to resist sliding. It has to be made of something that is bug proof, that will not rot. This means a stone product, concrete or block in most cases. It has to be dimensionally perfect. I mean, it has to be the size of your house. It has to be level. And if there are steps in the foundation, they all need to be uniformly flat. It needs to be set on soil that has been prepared or it needs to be built in such a way that it interacts with the soil so you don't get any more than about a half an inch of settlement or specifically differential in settlement between any two places in the house. And ideally, you would have no differential. I mean, if the whole house settles half an inch, that's one thing. But if one part of the house settles none at all and the other settles an inch or an inch and a half, now that's a problem. So your, your foundation has to be calculated and understood so it works with the soil conditions on the site to provide stable footing. It has to be able to get wet where it needs to get wet. It has to be able to remain dry where it needs to remain dry. It has to have the attachments, the hold downs, the anchor bolts, those kinds of things that will attach the structure to the foundation and you have to be able to afford it. Generally speaking, you have three fairly typical choices when it comes to a foundation. You might put your house on a basement, you might put your house on a crawl space, or you might put your, your house on a slab on grade. Now we have a video about basements and why we are not choosing that here. So that leaves us with the opportunity to talk about putting this house on a crawl space or on a slab on grade. When I talk about building on a crawl space, it's a foundation that allows you space to crawl underneath your floor. How is this done? It's done by trenching around the perimeter to get down to a soil elevation that is maybe below a frost line or down to a, 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 an elevation where the soil moisture content is consistent or down to a level where the compaction is uniform or down to whatever place for whatever of these um, dirt work reasons pertain to your site you know you're at the right elevation for placing a footing. So you have, with a crawl space, you've established how deep you're going to trench your footing. You've established with an engineer's help how wide your footing is going to... The footing, by the way, is the bottom part of the foundation. It's wider than the stem wall. It's wide so that the weight of the structure that's pushing down on that foundation is spread over as much soil as it needs to be to hold up the weight of the structure. Some footings are 12 inches wide, some are 16, some are 24, some are 10 feet wide or wider. In this case, I'm guessing since it's a two-story house, part of this lot is fairly soft, part of it is pretty hard. I'm guessing that the footings will probably be 16 inches in some areas and 24 inches in others. Maybe a uniform 24 inches, perhaps wider. But in any case, the footing has to be wide enough to hold things up. It has to have rebar in it. The rebar is there to provide tensile strength in the footing and to provide a way to connect the stem wall, which is the vertical part of the footing, to that footing, whether the stem wall is made of concrete that's cast in place or cinder block. So the stem wall, the foundation wall, is the part that sits on the footing and comes up whatever height you need to come up to get up above the level of the dirt and then far enough up that the bottom of your floor joists, those are the boards that carry the floor, and the bottom of any beams that are supporting the floor joists in mid-span is far enough above the dirt under, underneath the house that the bugs can't get up and get a hold of that beam. That they can't, that you have room to crawl underneath the beam, crawl underneath the floor joists, get your work done, 
put your vapor barrier in, install the plumbing and the HVAC and do the work that needs to be done under there, regardless of what time of year or how fat you are or anything else. There needs to be a certain minimum clearance, which we'll talk about when we build this thing, if we use a crawl space. The footings need to be able to withstand the moisture that could occur. And what that means is there needs to be a footing drain. There needs to be a way to catch the water that's down where the footings are. There needs to be a way for any water that gets into the crawl space to find its way out. A lot of people will only consider a crawl space floor because they are concerned about walking on the concrete of a slab on grade foundation all the time. We would rather walk on a floor that has more life in it, i.e. a wooden diaphragm of floor joists, beams and floor joists and subfloor and, and uh, those kinds of things. The other type of foundation under consideration is a slab on grade. That's a concrete slab on grade. A slab on grade means a slab on dirt. Grade is dirt. When you change the grade, you're changing the elevation of the dirt. If a road has a steep grade, that means the dirt or the road is steep. So slab on grade is a concrete foundation poured directly on the ground, so you have a concrete floor on your ground floor. There are advantages and disadvantages. There are the disadvantages of having to do your plumbing in the dirt underneath the slab before it's poured. The, the um, attached disadvantage to that is if that plumbing ever breaks or leaks, now you have to break up concrete to get to it. That's a problem. There are the advantages of absolutely quiet. A concrete floor never squeaks. It never pops. It never, um, yeah, it's, it's quiet. It's cool in the summer. It's also cool in the winter. There is the advantage of if your construction is going to move forward slowly, you don't have to worry about your concrete floor getting wet while your framing's happening and degrading like a plywood subfloor can. A slab on grade foundation depends on the concrete to resist the rot, to establish the dimension, to give compressive strength, to, to be poured in the shape that you need it, and it depends on the steel inside of that concrete for the tensile strength to keep it from cracking and pulling apart. There are two different ways you can put steel in a slab on grade foundation for a house. You can put in rebar. You may have seen us do that in some of our earlier videos. It's put in on specific spacing, a specific distance from the bottom, uh, specific sizes tied in a particular way. The concrete is poured and when the concrete gets hard, it gets a hold of that rebar and it keeps it from cracking or if it does crack, it keeps it from pulling apart. It gives it tensile strength. The other way to put steel in a concrete slab on grade is with post-tension cables or tendons. These are very high tensile strength cables that are laid through the forms and in where the slab will be. The slab is then poured around those post-tension tendons and after the concrete gets really hard, those tendons are stretched hydraulically and then that tension is released into the concrete slab, holding it together. Picture giant rubber bands being stretched through your concrete slab and attached on each end, pulling that concrete together in all directions simultaneously. So not only do the cracks that happened before you tensioned it disappear, but it's impossible for any cracks to ever form. A slab like that distributes all of the weight of the building across the whole floor area, more or less. Think of a snowshoe sitting on a big fluffy drift of snow and holding you up. Your weight is distributed across the entire snowshoe. A post-tension slab functions kind of like that. It can handle more differential settling. It can handle a lot of things that other foundations just can't deal with. And frankly, we're thinking about post-tension. Let us know what you think. If you would like to see a standard rebar slab on grade, let us know. If you would be more interested in seeing a crawl space be formed and poured and poured and framed and decked and plumbed, let us know. If you're interested in post-tension, let us know. We haven't decided, but we've got to decide pretty soon. Thanks for watching.